Greetings all and welcome to week five of the semester. This week in history of medicine, we're going to explore the medical cultures of medieval Islam. During the millennium spanning the years 600 to 1600 CE, peoples claiming allegiance to Islam represented a highly successful, prosperous, and expansive civilization, one that encompassed parts of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. The diverse peoples of this civilization included Muslims, Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, and their interactions led to the creation of a dynamic, pluralistic medical culture. This week, we're going to learn a little bit about that culture. Upon hearing the words medieval Islamic medicine, perhaps the first thing that you think of is Ibn Sina. Known in the West as Avicenna, Ibn Sina lived in the late 10th and early 11th century CE. That was a period just after Islamic rulers had begun translating hundreds of ancient Greek and Roman medical texts into Arabic. This translation movement infused Muslim medical traditions with a hefty dose of Hippocratic thought and also set the stage for a revival of scientific medicine, that is, for medicine pursued along rational, empirical, naturalistic lines. Building on these foundations, doctors like Ibn Sina contributed much to the field, carrying out investigations into subjects their Greek predecessors had only begun to explore, and, on the whole, making medicine a much more systematic, synthesized realm of thought and practice. Reflecting on these contributions, many modern-day commentators credit medieval Islamic doctors like Ibn Sina with inventing a wide array of modern techniques and disciplines within medicine. Looking at the quotes on this slide, you can get a sense of how contemporary writers view the contributions of Ibn Sina and his generation. Islamic doctors of the medieval period are credited with a number of firsts in the history of medicine, including the first psychiatric hospitals, the first studies in population biology, and the first discourses on psychosomatic medicine. Statements like these, however, do not sit very well with some people. According to a fair number of historians, saying things like Avicenna was a pioneer of psychophysiology, or Avicenna's books like read like a modern course in population biology is deeply problematic. Why is this? Because, according to these historians, things like psychiatry and population biology are modern fields, fields of research and practice that did not exist in the medieval period and as such should not be equated with things that medical scientists did back then. Critics of statements like those on the screen accuse their authors of being presentist, that is, of inaccurately assuming that medieval medicine can be understood in terms of present-day ideas. We're going to spend a fair amount of time today talking about this idea of presentism. So, to give you a feel for it, I want to direct you to one particular controversy the aforementioned statements prompted. In 2008, Christopher Green, a clinician and historian, published an article on his blog, Advances in the History of Psychology, that drew attention to what he saw as several problematic claims on the History of Psychology Wikipedia page. He found that one particular user, a person named Jagged85, had added large amounts of material on this page that mischaracterized the work and the writings of medieval Islamic doctors. Among these additions were some of the statements you just saw in the previous slide. In criticizing the user's argument about how medieval Islamic doctors were doing things like psychology and psychiatry, 
Green leveled the charge of presentism at Jagged 85. For more on this accusation, see the excerpt I've posted in the column on the right side of the screen. This idea of presentism, or of looking at the past ahistorically, is a really big deal in history. Indeed, being called a presentist is a grave insult in academic history. And in medical history, people who do presentist analyses of the past are often accused of using something called the retrospectoscope. Though it sounds like a piece of medical technology, the retrospectoscope is actually just a conceptual tool. In what follows, I'd like to discuss this in more detail with you. I'd like to give you a deeper understanding of what the retrospectoscope is and talk about both its appeal and its use in the history of medicine. Hence, our questions for today, which you can read for yourself on the slide. In order to give you a sense of what the retrospectoscope is all about, I thought it'd be helpful to just jump right in and provide an example of this in action. And that example is Frederick Chopin. As in Frederick Chopin, the famous 19th century Polish pianist and composer. Chopin died in 1849 at the very young age of 39. And since his death, lots of people have tried to figure out what killed him. His death certificate gave his cause of death as tuberculosis, but some people believe that proof of this is lacking. And so, over the years, a number of rial diagnoses have been put forward. Some researchers who doubt that Chopin died from TB have suggested other kinds of physical maladies as his real cause of death, while others believe that he could have died from a psychiatric disorder. If you look at the tables on the slide, you can see some of the most prominent alternative explanations of Chopin's death that have emerged since the turn of the century. On the somatic side, these include allergies, valvular stenosis, cystic fibrosis, and most recently, genetic defects. On the psychopathological side, they include manic depression, major depressive disorder, and bipolar. The use of the retrospectoscope is particularly prominent in the genre of writing known as pathography. Pathographies are accounts that try to diagnose the conditions of famous historical figures by combining primary source research with modern-day medical science. Pathographers ask questions like, what was the disease that killed Frederick Chopin? They can also ask about diseases that affected entire groups of people in the past. With regard to this second question, one of the best examples of the retrospectoscope's use can be seen in the case of the Salem Witch Trials of 1693. In 1692, a witch panic swept through the colonial American town of Salem, Massachusetts. By the time the witch hunt had wound down, over 150 men and women were formally charged with the crime of witchcraft. Nineteen of these individuals were hanged. Several others died awaiting trial, and one man was killed by stoning. The panic began after several young girls in Salem started having strange fits, rolling all over the floor, crying and shouting, babbling randomly, and claiming that some invisible figure was poking and pinching them. The town's leaders believed that the girls were the victims of witchcraft, but since 1692, Many other theories have been advanced to explain these strange fits. For early 20th century psychiatrists, the girls' symptoms seemed to be consistent with a disorder they called conversion hysteria. According to the famous French doctor Pierre Janet, who in 1907 wrote a book called Major Symptoms of Hysteria, 
Conversion hysteria typically begins with a strange sensation somewhere in the body and then progresses to what we would today call the proverbial lump in the throat. As he wrote, quote, The patient has the sensation of too big an object, as it were, a ball rising in her throat and choking her. This symptom seems comparable to what one of the girls from Salem described when giving testimony to local authorities. A woman named Elizabeth Brown, for example, testified as follows. When the witch's specter did come, it was as birds pecking her legs or pricking her with the motion of their wings, and then it would rise up into her stomach. After that, it would rise to her throat in a bunch like a pullet's egg, and then she would turn back and say, Witch, you shan't choke me. Another attempt to apply the retrospectoscope to the Salem trials came in 1976 when a behavioral psychologist named Linda Caporiel published a paper arguing that the girl's abnormal speech, strained postures, and convulsions could be the symptoms of a disease called ergotism. Ergotism is caused by a fungus called ergot, which grows on certain kinds of grains, like rye. Ergot contains a toxin, and its properties are similar to those of LSD, which it is in fact used to make. Therefore, when ingested, ergot can cause gastric upset, convulsions, and mental symptoms like psychosis and mania. Looking at the weather conditions that prevailed in 1692 around the time of the Salem witch panic, Caporiel argued that Salem's physical environment would have allowed ergot to grow in great abundance. As the residents of Salem used grains to make bread and other food products, they could have ingested massive doses of ergot and then succumbed to ergotism. Caporiel found that most of the ergot would have flourished in the western part of Salem, which is where the girls having these strange fits lived. Most interestingly, she found that the minister of the town, whose daughter and niece were among the first girls afflicted, was paid in grain. So, she argued, there would have been ample opportunity for these girls to be infected with ergotism. Hopefully, these examples have given you a pretty decent idea of what the term retrospectoscope means and what retrospective diagnosis is all about. As you've seen from these examples, there are lots of people who think the retrospectoscope is a perfectly valid tool for investigating the past. But historians of medicine are generally not among them. While a few advocate the use of this tool, many, many more are skeptical as to its ultimate value. The historian Karenberg, whose definition we cited at the beginning of this lecture, calls retrospective diagnosis a futile ende endeavor. Agreeing with this, Andrew Cunningham, another critic of the retrospectoscope, argues that use of this tool threatens to turn past diseases into, quote, some early version of modern disease and hence of modern experience. The fundamental problem with retrospective diagnosis, according to most historians, is that it privileges our own knowledge above that of past cultures. As a tool, they argue, the retrospectoscope is built on a faulty assumption, the assumption that modern tools and concepts offer the best way to understand the past. Later in the week, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about retrospective diagnosis in the context of medieval Islamic medicine. But before we get to this, I want us to have a more general discussion about this methodology. What do you think about the retrospectoscope? Is it a good tool? Should we make use of it when doing medical history? Or is the retrospectoscope dangerous, something that we should avoid at all costs? In addition to discussing these things, in our first discussion of the week, I'd like to talk about those historians who are criti critics of the retrospectoscope. On what grounds do they oppose its use? Is their, oppos is their opposition to this valid or invalid? These are some of the things we'll talk about at the start of the week. <laughs>